My name is Mike Dando. I'm an assistant professor of communication arts and literature at St. Cloud State University in St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is about an hour outside of Minneapolis. Um, and I'm really glad you're here today. We have just an incredible lineup of, um, uh, of, of educators, of thinkers, of scholars, practitioners, and I'm really, really excited to talk about and learn alongside you all today. Um, so I'll share, I'll share my screen very, very quickly so that we can see what there is to see. I, of course, I have to close 10 windows. So uh, we have today um, a variety of people uh, who are gonna be presenting um, the Maker STEM project, the small electric car, objects to teach with the tree, making math equitable and redesigning science curriculum. And that's the, the direction or that's the uh, rather the order that we'll go in. Um, so first up we'll have um, Lacey, Sales and Jackie will be uh, presenting the Maker STEM project and um, I would encourage you all to take notes. And if you could, um, there's a, a question and answer. Uh, should be a, a question and answer button. If you have questions, I can I can monitor that as well. But uh, do we have everybody here, Lacey? Are, we, we have everyone here, Lacey and Sales and and Jackie. You all are you all are here. So I will mute myself and let you start the show. All right, I'm gonna take it from next slide. That one? Yes, thank you. Hooray, thank you everyone. <laughs> so the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology Maker Lab is a discovery laboratory and learning space for teachers. It is funded by the National Science Foundation. This project is a collaboration between the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, AKA HIMB, and the College of Education at the University of Hawaii. It is integrating makerspace design elements into teacher professional development. And you can see from these pictures, the physical space of Maker Lab is pretty spectacular and beautiful. It is on Coconut Island, also known as Moku Olo'e, which is on the east side of Oahu. And the commute is just a short boat ride. And in addition to the research labs and facilities, there's some sharky permanent residents. You can see a hammerhead in one of the lagoons. Next slide. Did that work? Yes, awesome. Yes! Okay, sorry, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So the experience for teachers who are part of Maker Lab involves two parts. First, all the teachers in the cohort were together for several guided trainings in microscopy, 3D printing, genomics, proteomics, mechatronics, and field techniques. And this stage was all about connecting with one another and being empowered with new technical science skills. And then in a second part, teachers transitioned to independent projects. So this involved more one-on-one, -on -one, small group mentoring. And it was a chance for each teacher to design and spearhead their own project to achieve their goals in a way that was specific to their particular classroom situation. Next slide. Thanks, Sales. So, aloha everyone. My name is Lacey Chen. I'm a 10th grade biology teacher at Waianae High School along with Sales. Um, first of all, I grew up on the east side of Oahu, and I've always heard about the awesome facilities at HIMB on Mokuolo'e. So one day, I hope that I could experience what it was like to be a scientist on HIMB. So now fast forward a few years later, Makerspace was offered to all the teachers on Oahu, so I immediately signed up to fulfill my dreams. Um, but it was a little bit different this time because now I'm coming in with the lens of an educator. So if we look at the map, the little yellow circle is where HIMB is located and the red circle is where Waianae High School, which is the high school that I teach at, um, which is on the leeward coast of Oahu. So a little bit about Waianae High School, it's listed to have about 62% 60 per, uh, of our students identify as part Native Hawaiian. So also as part Native Hawaiian myself, um, I was wanting to search for place-based learning and teaching science specific to Hawaii. So Waianae is a Title I school with many of our students in low-income households. So before um, we got into Makerspace, I had to ask myself a few questions, which we can see on the next slide. So if our goal was authentic inquiry, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So if our goal is um, authentic inquiry, sorry, one slide back. <laughs> I think it just didn't register yet. Okay, thank you. So if our goal is authentic inquiry, I had to ask myself, what do my students need? What do they want, especially in YNI? Um, am I allowing them to explore science or am I just giving them the answers? Um, am I limiting their creativity in any way? So if we go to the next slide, which we already kind of saw, right? We learned that science is creativity and failing is essential. So that was one of the main takeaways that I took from Maker Lab. And if we go to the next slide, we did learn a few ways to create authentic inquiry. Um, the first way was through nonlinear experimental design, which you can see we used on the picture to the right. Um, and we are constantly reflecting and refining our project. We also learned the laboratory techniques that Sales discussed earlier and overall place-based learning because we're working with facilities specifically on Oahu. Um, and on the next slide, we also learned how to integrate art through illuminated science notes, notebooks, <clears throat> which we learned watercolor and sketching techniques to improve our notes. We've also been seeking out new ways to do this virtually, which has been really exciting, um, introducing new media. And we also did snorkel and sketches with uh, the beaches at HIMB. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Sales so she can talk a little bit more about our project. Next slide. So hi again, my name is Sales Day. Like Lacey, I teach 10th grade biology at Waianae High School. Next slide. When it came time to choose our projects, I was really unsure for a while of what I wanted to do. And I remember being asked, well, what is a question you've always wanted to answer? When you have all the tools and support you need, what is it that you want to create or find out? And that opportunity felt pretty incredible and I wanted my students to also experience the same. First of all, to feel limitless possibility to explore and investigate. And second of all, to answer questions that are novel and meaningful. So as Lacey already shared, in Waianae, our students and their families are closely, deeply connected to the ocean. And I also wanted students to do something where no one, including me, knew what the outcome would be and where the results would potentially be really important to their community. Next slide. So I eventually decided that my project would be DNA barcoding of store-bought fish in Waianae. So this is based on a nationwide finding that a third of seafood is mislabeled. And projects like this have been done before at the secondary and college level, but never before at our school or on the Waianae coast. So step one was to buy fish from a local supermarket. And many students insisted that they only eat what they or their families have caught. So we also decided to use some of those samples in addition to store-bought because they were really intrigued by that. Um, another great connection from Maker Lab was to Ina Informatics, which is a mobile sequencing lab. So they were able to provide portable equipment for us to do the steps two and three of the experiments. Um, and then to wrap it up and bring out another side of the scientific process, after the DNA had been sequenced and matched to species, students had the option to either write a scientific lab report or an article or a letter of advocacy. Next slide. So Lacey and I did a run through of this project to troubleshoot before doing it with students. And my students were really psyched about this project and opportunity, but sadly it was cut short by the COVID school closures. So this didn't fully happen in the classroom, but hopefully will be at some point. Um, on the left, you can see all the store-bought fish that we use for the experiment. And then on the right is Lacey preparing a gel. Thank you. Next slide. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to talk to you guys today. Like, this is so cool that we just get to connect in this place. Uh, so I'm Jackie, and I, I was teaching at Waipala High School, 11th grade marine science when I did this project, but shout out to my new school, Kuhala High School. Next slide, please. And so the way that I thought, um, I guess kind of where my project came from was, um, first of all, I love plankton labs because any plankton looks cool under the microscope and kids just get so into it and you don't even need fancy stuff to kind of collect them and do that. You just need a microscope and it doesn't have to be a fancy one either. 
Um, but one thing is that we were kind of limited by harbors and rivers and places being kind of hard to access for students. And so I was thinking, um, one of the things that we did was we looked at plankton in the pro um, through our program. And then on the left is like my notes and stuff. And then I kind of it kind of hit me like it would be so cool to make an RC boat that is something that the kids could be a part of to make two that would actually tow a plankton net and then so it, we could be a learning process in itself and then also be functional to collect plankton at places where we can't um, you know reach from the, the harbor or from the sides so go ahead and do next slide please and so what I learned through this process is um, well, what was what I was finding out through this process was that there really wasn't a one-stop shop for like what I wanted. <laughs> so I kind of realized like everything was either like too fancy, like super super expensive, like collectible kind of boats, or they just cost a small fortune, and that's not really possible in a Title One school. Um, just like just like Waianae High School, so is um so is Waipahu, and also just kind of being a public school teacher. And so it was really interesting, kind of realizing that I was trying to create something that didn't exist before. And that in itself was so cool because the whole tinkering process was just um, learning as I go. And so next slide, please. And so my takeaway through all of this was that, you know, there's really nothing wrong with, like I said, learning as you go because the process of like reveling in the process of learning and kind of seeing what you need to know and being the being the boss of what you want to learn and what you want to know and finding those answers on your own is just such genuine learning that I just felt really empowered through this whole process and what started as a little sketch in my notebook on the left right there that was what like when the idea hit me to like an actual um boat that you know I ordered all these parts from different places of the world just like you guys and uh, where I mean like how you guys are in different places anyways weird joke um, but anyways it just was really cool because even though I had access to all this resources and knowledge um, through this program I realized that at the end of the day um, you know even if I didn't have them I would still be empowered because um, there wasn't really one answer for just what I wanted to create. I had to like make it on my own. And so that's really kind of like what was the coolest part of being a part of this program and being able to kind of tinker and create your own project. So, next slide, please. Yeah, so that's pretty much um, a little bit about both of our projects that we did. So a couple of closing remarks, some words of encouragement to all of you educators. So we're just going to leave some time for you to kind of read through what each of us really took away from this project. And we just want to say thank you for sharing this learning space with us. Mahalo. That was fantastic. In the uh, in the interest of time, um, so rather than um, since we actually have have this going, and I, uh, rather than take it down and put it back up, um, what I'd like to do is just to to continue with the sharing so that we can kind of make it a little more efficient, if that's okay. Um, learning on the fly. Um, I needed those words to hear about like, well, we learn on the fly, and gosh, reveling in reveling in in learning like that's it i love it okay so we will keep on keeping on and we'll we'll have a little bit of time hopefully at the um at the end so here's uh um and if you if you want to you can drop your your information in the um in the chat but thank you again so much all right we will keep the we will keep the the progress we'll keep we'll keep things going again clap clap emoji or the celebration emoji everything's appropriate so it just feels not unlike if you remember the the show the the muppet show and our next our next act <laughs> our next guests um we have uh ready to go um technical technological applications in physics teaching uh construction of a small electric car and cart so i will turn it over to you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am Jorge Vale, teacher of physics at Lourenço Castanho School in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, next, please. 
This project was carried out by grade 12 students and had a duration of eight months. The subjects involved were physics and educational technology. The methodologies used were project-based learning, creative learning, and blended learning. Some theoretical influences were Seymour Papert, Mitchell Resnick, and Paulo Blickenstein. Next, please. Uh, we have used the maker and digital fabrication method to engage students with the physical concepts like speed, acceleration, time, distance, some electronic components, Arduino, and any block programming. Next, please. Uh, we divided students in groups and proposed the construction of the prototype of an electrical vehicle to measure in an autonomous way the time interval between four consecutive marks on the ground. With this information and knowing the distance between two consecutive marks, we are able to find the average velocity and acceleration of the vehicle. Next, please. One more, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here we have some pictures showing the students building these electro car prototypes. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, this is the diagram uh, to the electrical connection between the motors, age bridge, Arduino, batteries, LCD display, and optical sensors. Next, please. Uh, the materials and components were MDF chassis, cut on CNC laser cut, four DC motors and wheels, nine volts and four 1.5 volts batteries, Arduino board, LCD display, and reflective optical sensor. Next, please. Uh, here are the work stages and time consumed in each stage. Preparation phase, one month. Hands-on, five months. Final phase, one month. And community integration, one month. Now my friend Regina is here and we will continue the presentation with you. Thank you very much. Next, please. Uh, the project, uh, electric cart for project. So this is the second project. Uh, the intention for constructions of the cart, uh, which was not even planned at the beginning of the project, was to use the students' own enthusiasm and create a new vehicle whose acceleration would depend on the user. The two projects are very similar, the only difference being that in the cart acceleration is very Please, next one. Next one. Um, so, I will talk a little bit about CIPIC. We have a, a lot of components here in this cart, and uh, we have uh, PVC pipes, electric motors of Honda Biz motorcycle, finger acceleration, on and off key, reflective optical center, Arduino and display LCD to visualize time interval information, two headlines and the two LDR sensor, one illuminate plate through addressable new pixel, all programming in any block. Next, please. Work stages, preparatory phase, learning and programming the Arduino board and any block, hands-on, researching, planning, build the cart and the programming. Final phase, average calculation and the tests of a prototype, community integration, students participate in the school annual 
cultural fair. Next, please. Uh, difficulties face it. Find the right materials. Tool handling. Assembly of prototypes. Correct choice of sensors. Finally, the challenges of programming. Example, direct tractions of the axle replaced by one belt. A student solution through internet research and books, specialized shops and professionals that work at electrical bicycle and motorcycle repair shops. Despite all students' effort, the cart still needs improvement. For example, substitution of PVC tubes, which proved less stable for a material that is less flexible. Next, please. The students' conclusion. They recognize the great improvement in their understanding of physics concepts, which before the project were more abstract. Next, please. Next, please. The use of uh, new electronic and technological components gave them the knowledge to use those same components in future projects. They observe that the incentive to creativity, persistence, and cooperation among them was something very positive. The project offered them a unique opportunity to make real something they had imagined. Next, please. They realized that the constructions of a small prototype of an electric car generate questions about environmental issues, like elimination of CO2 emissions or other gases in the atmosphere, as well as noise reduction and in the future, car accident collision prevention. Next, please. Uh, here is a cultural fair visitor driving the cart. Next, please. Teachers' conclusion. The project demand a deep knowledge in the areas of physics and educational technology. Its execution was supported by students' persistence and interest and by the results obtained along the process, despite the difficulties facing. We consider the maker and digital fabrication approach a powerful learning research. I, uh, we finished the presentation, but I would like to, to thank uh, FabLearn, Lorenzo Castanho School, Daniela Bertaro High School Coordinator, Fabio Antunio Middle School Coordinator, and our school principal, Alexandra Vatepal. Thanks also for our friends that help us a lot, Cecilia and Tiago Genovese. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, this is, I know this is kind of coming fast and, 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 and furious, but I do want to keep an eye on the time. Um, so we will just keep things rolling for the time being. Again, I um, want to thank everybody for their, uh, all their comments in the chat. Um, but now uh, we'll just, as we said, we'll keep it, we'll keep it moving. Um, and it's just, these are such fun projects, I could talk about them all day. But we will just keep things, keep these going. Um, remaking teacher learning, designing objects to teach. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're here to talk to you about remaking teacher learning by designing objects to teach with to promote uh, math education reform. Next slide, please. So this is our team. Um, they're all saying hi, even though you can't see them. Um, and I'm Erin. 
And I'm Jessica. Hi, everyone. And we're, uh, we're both prospective elementary math teachers, PMTs, uh, as we'll call them in this, in this presentation, and researchers on this project, and we'll be presenting for our whole team today. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to give you a little background on where we're coming from. We connect with Papert's constructionist perspectives on teaching and learning. You guys are probably familiar with him, but he believed in designing learning environments that promote inquiry, exploration, and wonder in students. Um, and he also believed in making space for learners to bring themselves into their mathematical content and in the value that constructing or making brings to the learner's experience. So that's what we did. Uh, we incorporated a making experience into a course for PMTs and asked what learning opportunities it might bring for reforming their thinking and pedagogy. Next slide, please. Thanks, Erin. And this background gives rise to the task that was set out for the PMTs. That is to design and 3D print an orig original manipulative to support a child's learning of mathematics. In addition to making the manipulative, the PMDs would also share their tools with the child in an interview setting with the aim of developing the child's mathematical understandings using the manipulative. So during this whole process, the tool was deliberately designed by the PMTs with a specific child in mind, which was a crucial component of the task we designed. On this slide, we could get a glimpse into how the process behind the task can unfold. Here, a PMT, Dave, designed geometric shapes for explorations, including prisms, and a design software program called Tinkercad, which is in the upper left-hand corner. And then just to the right, we see Dave testing out his tool in class. And that's Dave's, Dave with his child, Vincent, on the right-hand side during the clinical interview for the sharing of his mathematical tool. Next slide, please. So Erin and I are now going to take this opportunity to share our stories, which help us address our underlying question. And that is, what was it about the culture of the maker environment and the knowledge and experiences of PMTs who worked within it that interacted with and informed their designs and pedagogy? Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll start with my story. Um, I came into this course as a pre-service teacher with a background in fine arts, actually. And up until this point, I was never, never able to really explore how my experiences as an artist and my experiences as a doer of mathematics might inform each other. Uh, and at that time, I was working with a fourth grade student in a resource room. And I could see that he needed the opportunity to really explore fraction concepts. So I created the fraction orange, which is um, the image on the top left of your screen. And from this design uh, and interview process surrounding my orange, a couple of best practices emerged. The first one uh, was to foster opportunities for self-expression through creative acts. So although I worked through a lot of my thinking and planning and discussion with my classmates and my teachers during class, as you can see in the image on the right, my design experience was very intuitive uh, and individual. And you can see uh, my Tinkercad work plane on the bottom left there. I found a lot of value in having the flexibility to create and bring myself to the work. And I was able to bring my confidence in designing and creating to the class, which eventually turned into this foundation of confidence in doing and teaching mathematics that actually changed the trajectory of my, of my whole life. Um, and another best practice that, practice that emerged was the sharing of my ideas and manipulative with, the real, with real mathematical learners and doers. So for me, the interview brought value to actively pursuing what my student didn't know, and it turns out what I didn't know either, um, and nurtured the sort of inquiry-driven learning that can be a little uncomfortable at times. So this discomfort of not knowing really came to the forefront for me when I decided to share my orange and some fraction division problems with adults, including my 72-year-old dad at the time. He's the, the guy in the middle. Um, and these sharing experiences ended up being really special and truly revealing as we struggled to navigate between our traditional approach to fraction division, which was the flip and multiply algorithm, and really exploring what doing fraction division meant with the orange. So I walked away with not only a much deeper understanding of what it means to divide fractions, but also how, to, how valuable it is to explore the unknown in mathematics teaching and learning. Next slide, please. So for me, this project really helped me 
to more deeply understand what it truly means to teach mathematics with meaning. And what I mean by that is, you know, through this nonlinear process, my partner Maya and I underwent as we designed our tool, one which we named Nomas Caídas. We came to understand firsthand what it means to provide students with opportunities to experience, you know, all the false starts and tangents that both the processes behind designing and the mathematics can bring. In fact, Maya and I became close over the course of our project as we actually underwent about 10 different design iterations during which we utilized our in-class design discussions to lean into Maya's funds of knowledge that came from her cultural experiences and stories from learning math in the Dominican Republic. And you can see how we sketched out our ideas as we thought through these design decisions together on the left on this slide. And then on the middle right, here we are having a lot of fun um, in class testing out No Mas Caídas. And really it kind of transformed into this beautiful, simple tool for counting while playing with marbles. We intentionally designed the tool to be used with everyday objects as counting objects. And this was done as a testament to Maya's childhood of counting with beans in the Dominican Republic. So for Maya and I, no Mas Caídas became a token of self-expression and can really help us all see how this homemaking experience created a model for an environment where people are encouraged and able to support one another. And that's really a culture that's centered on caring while embracing learning as an iterative process. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Jess and I already touched on a couple of best practices that were gleaned from our own experiences, but we wanted to share some other ones with you. So one is to focus on human and learner centered design in the classroom. For example, the PMTs were asked to design their manipulatives based off of an interview that they conducted with a child. Um, that helped them better understand who the child was and what the child knew. And then the PMTs created a tool that responded to that particular child in a holistic way. Another best practice is to support collaborative and participatory practices in the classroom. So our teacher educators, or TEs as we'll call them, were invested in creating an environment where students' insights were honored and where um, they were supported in bringing their cultural resources to the project. For example, uh, Dr. Greenstein offered Maya the possibility of submitting her work in her native language and her own native culture informed the design of her tool. And finally, our TEs enacted a philosophy of caring and active listening in the classroom. So Dr. Fernandez came to the class with an anxiety, an anxiety about being able to pursue open-ended thinking within an environment of new technology, um, but it melted away as she realized that the project offered this wealth of opportunities to instantiate a caring and active listening philosophy. And in that, she realized that she was able to pursue those valuable tangents and alternative ways of thinking with her students in a new way within this new environment. And it also created this multi-tiered caring that kind of telescoped starting from the TE down to the PMT and into their designing of the learning environment for their own students in their own classrooms. So to sum it up, we claim that embedded in these maker practices are new pathways to mathematics, teaching, and learning, um, the kinds that resist the sort of traditional transmission-based school mathematics, and one that uh, reincorporates creativity, personal relevance, and opportunity for explorative understanding in our mathematics classrooms. Next slide, please. So with that, we thank you very much for your time and attention. And please visit us at our website. Thank you so much for sharing this space with us today. Everyone take yes. care. Thank you. That's, there's so much to talk about. I'm seeing everyone's like, thank you so much. I think everybody's eyes light up, which is just giving me, giving me life as well. Um, I just want to talk about each of these projects. We will, um, we will keep on keeping on. We'll continue with this amazing, um, this amazing space. Um, with some work on in indigenous languages. Um, so again, just in the interest of time, um, not to, not to be, be hurried, but to give space, um, I will um, uh, afford you, the, I will cede the space to, to the next group. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Silvana. 
I'm from the Innovation Technology in Creative Learning at Magno, a private school in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, the project is inspired by 2019 UNESCO theme, the International Year of Indigenous Language. Okay, so next slide, please. <laughs> okay, the Ibira, the tree. Okay, a moment. This, the Ibira is a project done by uh, kindergarten and first grade students, okay? And the project start, begins with a question, okay? Next slide, please. How many languages are spoken in Brazil? Sorry. The majority of children answered Portuguese. Only a few said Portuguese and the indigenous language, okay? Next slide, please. 274 languages are spoken in Brazil. Uh, so during the whole year, uh, the kids were asked to choose the words they want to know the meaning, okay? And created a Tupi Guarani illustrated dictionary. Next, please. Tupi Guarani is not exactly a language, okay? It's a linguistic family. Um, many words that we use to describe places, types of foods, animals, trees come from Tupi. Um, they are five, six year old kids. They are in the, they are beginning uh, at, at literacy, okay? So uh, look what some children said. I like to be Guarani because every word has a meaning. I said, but the same thing happens in Portuguese. Which word has its meanings? And Esther said, no, no, it's not the same thing because Tatuapé, Tatuapé is a neighborhood in Sao Paulo. Tatuapé means Caminho do Tatu, something like Armadillos, Armadillos uh, Path, okay? Madalena, my favorite food is Tupi Guarani, tapioca. Do you know tapioca? Tapioca is uh, a popular uh, Brazilian dish made of uh, cassava, manioc. I don't know how, how you say it in, in English, okay? Um, Luca got very upset when he discovered that Ibirapuera, Ibirapuera is a park in Sao Paulo. Ibirapuera doesn't mean up a place full of trees. Ibira, tree. Puera, a place full of trees, for sure. Ibira puera means rotten tree. Okay? It, it went, uh, it, it uh, wore, uh, when we found out that we have a lot more indigenous influence that we had imagined, okay? Next slide, please. Okay, these are some dictionary pages and a small research, okay? Everybody knows uh, how children love animals, okay? And they were very excited to learn that some indigenous body paintings and basketry, okay, basketry, uh, are inspired by animal skins and with the meaning of the some birds' names. For example, curio, 
Curió means human friend, okay? The project goal is not to emphasize the indigenous stereotype, but to value their culture and their connection with the nature. Next slide, please. So, in order to represent not only the indigenous connection, but our connection with nature, we created our own Ibira, our beak with snakes and birds. Next, please. Okay, the students chose uh, how to make the animals. We used digital tools like uh, Legwidu to give movement to snakes and birds. Uh, scratch to reproduce the nature and animal sounds, LED lights, um, coin batteries, and next, please. And simple materials like wools, cardboards, papers, uh, colored pencils. Okay, and this is Luca. This is Luca. Next, please. The cutest inhabitants ever. Jiboya, snake, corn snake, curió, pitanguá, tucano, arara. Next, please. So uh, let's give the children a sense of belonging and the opportunity to celebrate our differences. Um, unfortunately, uh, everyone here knows um, that the Amazon rainforest is on fire right now, okay? So we have a special message for all of us. Next, please. For the police, arrest the criminals who are burning everything, protecting the animals, protect my future. Okay, Arthur is, is uh, a six years old kid, okay? So thank you everyone for listening to me. Thank you. Next, next, okay. Next. Okay. Oh my gosh. Wow. 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 Um, again, uh, <laughs> this, I, I would love to, sp to speak with everyone um, about this, but I do want to uh, be cognizant of time. Um, uh, if, if you need to, if you need to, to leave uh, a little early, that is okay. Um, Appreciate everyone. If you can stick around for just a little bit, um, we would really, we would really love to to keep this going. Um, make, making math equitable is up next, so we'll just get right right into it. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to hear all of these stories so far. My name is Krista Flores. I am a senior Fabler and Fellow and the Maker Educator for Marvelous Math Club. Here to share the story of Marvelous Math Club is Marta Akala Williams, who is the Executive Director of Equity and Community Engagement for Asheville City Schools here in Asheville. Mackenzie Bennett, who is the North Carolina After School. Can you hear me okay? Now? Okay, sorry. My name is Krista Flores. I'm a senior Fab Learn Fellow and Maker Educator for Marvelous Math Club. Here to share the story of this amazing club is Marta Akala Williams, who is Executive Director of Equity and Community Engagement for Asheville City Schools. You can hear me okay, you keep waving. Okay, we're fine. <laughs> um, and Mackenzie Bennett, North Carolina's After School Vista volunteer, and Dr. Sam Kaplan, Chair of Mathematics for the University of North Carolina in Asheville. Next slide, please. 
Smith is slow. So you'll recognize a lot of these projects, which is building with strawberries uh, and doing paper circuits. And if you, next slide, please. You will all recognize cooking in the kitchen as great ways to learn mathematics. What's very, very special about this story is not the projects, it's actually the foundations of this uh, Marvelous Math Club Outreach Collaboration, which is collaboration between Asheville City Schools, the UNC Asheville University, and Asheville Public Housing. And we're gonna hear more about what makes it so amazing and so important to our community here in Asheville from one of its co-founders and my next speaker, Marta. Marta, take it over. Thank you, Krista, and thank you everyone that is fine. present. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Yes? Okay. Next so, um, and thank you to all the presenters thus far. This is so exciting. Um, so I want to just discuss, I mean, as you see the amazing things that um, Krista has um, shown that we've done at Marvelous Math Club, which is a club, and it ties in a little bit with what you were saying, Silvana, right, to create a space where students feel like they belong, but we don't call students students. We call them math leaders, and we call ourselves math champions, so that we can automatically eliminate the power dynamics and instead this is like a club where we all belong and we have like shared leadership and a lot of love and a lot of magic and creativity and how we interact with each other so we say that we are a family and it at the beginning was a little like but are we and then we're kind of like yeah we really are right and and just kind of working through all of that and so right now i just want to go through how we have created this by listening to the community and to the students, which we call leaders, right? And the reason why I keep saying students is because we want to undo the school thing, right? We want it to feel like, how do I belong? And how do I get to show you what I know too? Because we are all able to learn from one another, right? So we talk about asset and justice-based practices and language and thinking. And we used to just say language. And then we thought, hmm, you know, people then get really, really smart and just memorize them. And like, Mar, would you quiz me? Because I learn all the asset-based um, language. And we just want it to come into your bodies and see how it can transform us, right? So we're, with asset and justice-based practices, thinking and language, it's not just transforming the leaders, it's transforming the champions, it's transforming the community, it's shifting the culture, it's changing the narrative from there's being something deficit wrong to something asset amazing and beautiful, okay? So next slide. We're going to go like to what, what are our gifts and talents instead of what's missing, right? In an interest of time, I just want you to look at this, right? And so you see on the left side that we have help and needs and, you know, all of the improve and structure and program. And I don't want anyone to think like, oh man, because I said that because we're on a, on a growing learning journey together, right? We had to embark on it as well. And then if you look on the other side, we have support instead of help and priorities instead of needs right instead of improve we grow and enhance and instead of structure right because it has like that white supremacy culture frame that who's in charge who has the power dynamics blah 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 right we want it to be like so inviting that you want to come to it right so you even see here with program we don't use program because it has a negative connotation to people that are impacted negatively by racism or by all of the oppression in our country culture um so we use club we use marvelous math club and then this way everyone wants to be a part of it right next slide and i know there's going to be words there that you're going to be like but why not right so we all know or at least here in Asheville, we love a needs assessment let's go find out what the needs are of the community let's go find out what's the need of blah 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 right and so that automatically shows that there's a deficit what about a power analysis right black and brown people we have i mean so many gifts and talents i mean the resiliency we have to bring into the universe it's like hello you might want to learn a little bit about what I know, because what you know is you're a central middle class, you're, a, you know, curriculum that doesn't work for all of us. We embark in it and we eat it, but it doesn't feel natural to us. It doesn't feel inviting and engaging and yummy, right? Y'all can nod and whatever, because I'm trying to go really fast. If I was talking to Spanish, I go really fast. Um, 
Okay, next slide. <laughs> and I, I, this is really interesting. I know we won't have time for uh, questions and I wish that we did. Look at this one, at-risk youth. And we hear that so often, right? At-risk youth of color, we're gonna get money for at-risk youth of color. So to us, we say, at, if you, if someone had, was at risk of getting diabetes, we wouldn't say they're at risk of, right? We would say they're at risk of getting diabetes. So for me, for us in our family, we say at risk youth, at risk of what? White supremacy culture? If you can't say the whole thing, don't use it because it makes us feel broken and we're not, right? Okay, next slide. Is it your turn, Mackenzie? Almost? Okay, oh, okay, disenfranchise. Right? I didn't wake up and say, hi, my name is Marta, I'm disenfranchised, right? I was pushed to disenfranchisement, right? I was pushed to the margins. I was pushed to all of the things by white supremacy culture. It is really important for us to keep that center because it is so, so important, right? Not to make me the word that you want, but to talk about the circumstance. So that then I don't internalize that and then think that they're that I'm broken, right? I am the at-risk youth brown person, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not. You all created this. I am amazing and I'm going to rock it if you are willing to partner with me and see my amazingness and the talent and the genius in me, right? Okay. Next slide, because I don't know if it's mine and I'm trying to go really fast. Hello, uh, my name is Mackenzie Bennett, and I'm the AmeriCorps Vice so with Marvelous Math Club, and I work alongside Marta and Dr. Kaplan and Krista Flores. And at Marvelous Math Club, we have adopted a few unique mindsets with our students who we call math leaders. Uh, we promote self-care 24-7, so if a math leader does not feel up to coming and um, engaging in math, that's totally okay because it's their choice to be there. Nothing's required. Um, and we're in their home too, so they can easily go home that day. And we invite them the next day, next week, and we we they choose to come, so they love to come, and that's how they keep coming back. And with that, no one gets kicked out either. Like Marta said, we're all a big family, and we practice revolutionary love. So leaders know that no matter what they are, what they do they, that day or the next day, they are still loved and accepted by us, um, which is key for young leaders to feel comfortable in a space to grow math confidence and leadership skills. At the end of every Marvelous Math Club meeting, we form a, a circle and we call it the Sherry Circle. And this is a time for volunteers and uh, who we call math champions to send affirmations to leaders to showcase what they did today or just anything they would like and uh, then the whole group would clap and cheer and praise and every leader you could tell whenever they get good vibes or good words coming to them they instantly set up straight like toss their hair like yeah it's you're talking about me and that just grows their confidence being in this space and so the key to me and to all of us that I feel is with Marvelous Math Club success is it it does come from social and emotional acceptance and empathy. Uh, and now I'll pass it on to Marvelous Math Club other, other co-director, Dr. Sam Kaplan. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, and everybody, thank you for your patience. I'm so glad you're still here. Uh, just a few more words about Marvelous Math Club. Um, one of the questions we get right away when we talk about this fabulous idea is, well, does it have results? And it, our anticipation with the model is that by addressing social emotional support and using asset and justice based language and practice, providing positive self labeling such as math leader, math champion, allowing for hands on engagement with learning, which they don't always get in the regular school day, and celebrating math every time we meet, that that will naturally lead to higher grades of math because it will shift their relationship with the material, it will shift their relationship and expectations in the classroom. Uh, higher grades were never the goal. Again, the uh, goal was to provide a supportive space where we could celebrate math and build relationships. Um, however, uh, working with the school system, they wanted to assess how this was doing. So we divided um, the population into three groups uh, who live at Pisgah View Apartments, which is part of Asheville Housing. 
uh, students, elementary school students who attended all year, those who attended about half a year, and those who didn't attend Marvelous Math Club. The ones who came all year had 11 points higher on their, at the, by the end of the year, end of the school year. Oh, if you could move to the next slide, I apologize. I meant to, so go ahead to the next slide then. Beautiful. Uh, the ones who attended all year uh, were had at the end of the school year in math 11 points higher than the ones who didn't attend at all. And the ones who only came half a year, theirs uh, were eight points higher, and these were statistically significant results. Um, moreover, if you go to the next slide, uh, at the very beginning of the school year, those three groups were all within a point of each other at the end of the first quarter grades, which means it was not self-selecting that the brightest students were going to Marvelous Math Club. Uh, so uh, that really is an easy way to demonstrate potentially the, the strong impact of having an environment like that. Uh, next slide. We had a number of undergraduates who were involved, uh, as well as uh, members of the community uh, there at Pisgah View, some of the parents and grandparents, as well as professionals and retirees in the community. But uh, specifically uh, leaning on the undergraduates and asking them about their experiences, what we hear back uh, on the left is a word cloud of some of the words that they use to describe math. But uh, the three things that showed up repeatedly were understanding better about how racism uh, impacts the lives of children, discovering their own leadership and community building skills, and realizing there are multiple styles of learning and communication, uh, which uh, many of them are going to go on into teaching. So that's a wonderful thing to see. And I'm sure many of you are wondering what we've done since COVID started. Uh, we're doing everything we can to support uh, uh, lifting any barriers they have to engaging with learning. And uh, if you could skip two slides ahead. Uh, here's how you can reach us if you have more questions about Marvelous Math Club, uh, our practices, and uh, yeah, <laughs> any comments that you have. Thank you very much. Oh, that's, oh my gosh, it's so amazing. I love that idea of celebrating math, right? Like, it's, you don't do math, you celebrate it. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. Um, well, uh, I, I appreciate your patience with, uh, with, uh, with this, we are, um, we are concluding our time today. We are running a little bit over, but uh, that is is okay in 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 terms. Please don't feel feel rushed unless you need to unless you need to leave. We're happy to have you in this space, um, and so we'll conclude today um, with redesigning uh, redesigning science: a case study in uh, hydroponic greenhouse. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for waiting for the last. And I'm Lorenzo Guasti, and I did this, this uh, pilot research with uh, Jessica Newit Gori from Italy and Tamar and Livia uh, from Columbia uh, University of New York. Next. Educator panel. Okay, so we meet together in New York and we designed to. Uh, try to apply the bifocal modeling approach on uh, a new uh, experimental project using uh, uh, an hydroponic greenhouse at school, starting with uh, very young children and uh, going up uh, to the age. So in, 19, uh, in uh, 2019, we involved uh, four Italian schools, uh, five class, nine teachers, 112 students, uh, coming from seven-year-olds and going up uh, until 15 years old in the secondary. And uh, uh, an, uh, a special needs group uh, two of uh, 15 students that they was uh, 14, 15 year old, but they was using a uh, uh, methodology for the younger one. Okay, the next one. Uh, this is the set uh, that we all was uh, using in class. Uh, we uh, suggest uh, to the classroom, to the to build a do-it-yourself hydrophonic greenhouse uh, with the lights and the light timer to drive the time where the, the light was on, uh, using uh, just uh, water and nutrients for the plants, uh, and uh, using uh, uh, analogic and digital instruments to uh, measure the, uh, the variables involved in the, in the physical uh, 
project, like uh, the, the size of the plants, number of leaves, uh, uh, quantity of nutrients, and so on. Next. Uh, the bifocal uh, mod modeling uh, uh, um, it's, it's basic on uh, two moments. The first moment is uh, observing the physical experiment and make measurements data. The second moment is uh, doing a model, doing a simulation for the very young children was a model do in papers with draw. With the uh, older students was something with computer uh, simulation with a computer model. Uh, compassion of the two moments, uh, observation of the physical experiment and the mod modeling with the computer model or paper model, let the students become scientists and uh, become more uh, conscious of the experimental and the physical phenomenon that they are observing. Next. So, which is the big ideas and the questions that we was try to understand better? Uh, first of all, how models uh, contribute to understand the scientific phenomenon? And especially uh, if uh, students uh, doing this uh, pilot research uh, uh, improve uh, to understand how plants grow. Uh, next. So the core components that we, we was uh, involved in was uh, which kind of research tools. So we, we decided to do a, a pilot research in, the, in, the, in the, this class in Italy with the very standard Italian schools. So schools that usually do uh, science and STEM in a very standard way. So try to uh, change their way to doing science. And analyzing, evaluating, and verify the effectiveness of the methodology uh, with the interview, with questionnaire, and so on. And verify if uh, it was helpful to improve teaching of science in, a, in some uh, school that usually do conventional teaching. Next. So we create a set of uh, books of instrumental materials, uh, especially uh, an introduction that explain how the hydroponic system works, uh, a lesson plan, very accurate and very punctual, where every day the teachers know what they have to do in class, uh, a manual to, to build the greenhouse, uh, and of course, a, a book that explains the bifocal modeling approach and uh, that was physically given to the, to the teacher in class. Next. Uh, we uh, suggest uh, all the school to create a do-it-yourself uh, uh, hydroponic uh, greenhouse, uh, but some, some school prefer to use a commercial one. Uh, they, they do it yourself, and our opinion was better because they, they involve children from the beginning building the greenhouse and so they understand what they are what they was doing uh, creating and building the the, the greenhouse uh, where the uh, research and the activity was done uh, so they we, we leave uh, the, the teachers uh, uh, free to decide with the students which kind of variables uh, measure together so they was free to observe uh, the the phenomenon in the way they they prefer next Considering that uh, for all of that school were, was a brand new uh, research, they didn't uh, do something similar before, we prefer to uh, start uh, with a health bucket model uh, in NetLogo and in Scratch. Uh, it depends about the age of the students. So we gave them a, a very raw model and they ask to them to uh, use the model and understand how it works and uh, give us the suggestion how to improve it. So uh, the, the model was not perfect, but uh, was a way to ask to the students to improve it uh, in a certain way. Uh, next. Uh, 
using the, the tools uh, to verify the effectiveness of the research, uh, we realized that teachers was very, very excited and happy to do this pilot research. And had, as you can see in the graph, uh, all of the questions have an answer positive, considering, of course, some uh, minor chain change that uh, uh, challenging that we will see later. Okay, so in the next slide, we, we can see that even students were very happy and they improve the knowledge about plant growth, about modeling, and about uh, how uh, they can be more scientists. I remember in, in, uh, in 2018, when the, and the, the, the team of Columbia with Tamar and Livia and Paolo came in Italy, they was asking to the children, uh, do you feel like a scientist? And was very impressed that uh, this is a very key point uh, because students uh, feel like uh, science when they do science instead of read about science. Uh, next. Which was uh, the, 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 the small problem that we have to, no, next, sorry. Uh, Okay, which was the, the, the small problem that we had to improve in our research? First of all, uh, uh, the greenhouse, uh, it's, it's a long experiment. Okay, it's a long experiment because uh, plants need a lot, a lot of time to grow. So sometimes in class, uh, they don't have enough time to wait uh, all the steps of the grow of the plants. And of course, uh, an understanding a model, it's very challenging. So this is a very sensible point that we have to take uh, attention and, and pay attention and improve. And probably the plants grow, it's a complex phenomenon. Maybe using a phenomenon quite a bit easier can be a way to apply the methodology a bit better. Next. Uh, Okay, so the conclusion is that uh, was a positive experience and this year we will repeat again in a larger number of schools to go in deep in the research and uh, we are quite sure that the methodology is very good and very helpful for teacher and uh, we just need to fine tuning the experience with the, with the feedback of our pilot research. So. The next is the final slide and uh, I will uh, finish. Uh, give uh, thank you to everyone uh, to wait uh, one hour and a half uh, for us uh, and a compliment to everyone. It was very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness. And that's for, ev that is for, for absolutely everyone. And uh, I know we're over time. Uh, I have, my brain and heart and, and, and spirit are full, right? Um, the, the 10, look how many, I took all these notes. This was, this, I just started this. This is amazing uh, to see the work that you all are doing. Um, I hope that you are able to uh, please um, to be uh, in contact with each other to ask about these projects because from, from North Carolina to Hawaii to Brazil, to, I mean, this is a global, like the celebration of learning and the centering of indigenous practices of who students are not, we talk a good game about meeting students where they are, but to see this is what it means. This is the work and this is what science can do. This is what learning can be. Just you're so all in, you are all just inspiring. Like I want to go now do science. I want to go do math. I want to go create literacy um, opportunities. And that's a testament to the work that you're doing. So congratulations to everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for being there for your students. Um, again, my, I'm Mike Dando. Um, I am, um, besides talkative, um, I'll just put my email address if you want to get in touch with me. Uh, at any point, uh, I'd be happy. I'd be thrilled to talk to you more. Um, but thank you so much for for you all, uh, for your participation and for your patience with me. Um, thank you so much. Fantastic session. This is, again, this has been recorded. 
Um, and thank you to the folks at FabLearn for doing this. I do have a podcast, Lacey. Uh, <laughs> what, a, what a nice question. Uh, I do have a podcast. Um, it deals with, liter it deals with crit critical literacy development. And uh, I, I didn't get into this, but um, my, my research focuses on the intersection of making popular culture and critical literacy for, de for democratic engagement. So I do a lot of work with Afrofuturism, with comics, and schools and how um, somebody said, uh, you feel like a scientist when you do science. So I do a lot of work with hip hop. And so you feel like you are a maker when you're making, when you're making a beat, et cetera. It's like, I have so many things. My brain is just, a, uh, if, you could if you took a CAT scan, it would just be a rainbow. But thank you to everyone. Um, and uh, I, I hope that this was a, a good conversation, a good space for you all today. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll wait till everyone else can, uh, hey Mike, uh, I'll, I'll put, leave this space open. Mike, would you put the podcast in the, in the chat? So oh, maybe sure. Can... Oh my gosh. Sure. Yes. Uh, give me, it, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can navigate to it. <laughs> um, it's called comics school. Um, and uh, just a second, uh, I'll bring it up here. You can get it on, um, if you look up comic school on, um, on Apple Music or, or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, Thank you, Mike. Oh, this was amazing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was super, super fun. Here, here we go. This is there's my there's my pod. That's the the podcast. Um, oh, this was so much fun. Thank you all for your understanding and uh, and, and and for for your flexibility. You got y'all. This is the work. This is a. I'm gonna get a little teary. This is what it's about. Y'all are just doing the thing. It's a tough time to be an educator. It's it's hard. It's nearly impossible when things are all going great and perfect. Uh, but these extra these extra challenges uh, really uh, are are showing us why we, what we do matters. You talk about scientific literacy mattering. Talking about artistic literacies mattering. Talking about democratic literacies mattering. I don't care if you're in Brazil or Hawaii or or where you are, the work that we do matters. Don't let, don't don't get shook. Pre, uh, good vibes from the the middle of the country, uh, of the middle of the United States, and feel free to reach out to me anytime. Y'all are the best. Y'all are just the absolute best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. And happy birthday, Krista. Happy birthday, Krista. Oh, did anybody catch how many attendees we had? It was some 78. Point. Great. That's <laughs> real. On a Zoom call on a Saturday? On that's a Saturday. A, that's a miracle, okay? That is, woo! Okay, uh, that's amazing. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Magic. It was we have honor. magic. That's right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Awesome Thank work, you. everyone. Oh, so good. So fun. <laughs>